Angel omelet. John chapter 16. We're really close to the conclusion. Could be tonight, could be Sunday. Could be next month. Um, no, I, I really do think we're, we're, we're close to this conclusion. I mean, we've been here since March. I mean, what have we not seen related to angels? Okay. Uh, and I'm, I've, I've gone crazy thinking, what's, what would really be the best conclusion? What would really be, you know, what could tie this together? What could, you know, what hasn't been said at this point? Um, well, the judgment of angels. What it is that they're looking forward to. Okay, uh, and this is what we're concluding with summary and conclusion. The fact that these angels are still waiting judgment day; they've not yet had their final judgment. They've had they've had certain judgments in the angelic past. They still have ongoing judgments in humanity present, but ultimately they're waiting for eternity future for their ultimate judgment, and we're going to be a part of that. All right, you know, we talk about what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to the beamer, to the judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us in this room, I trust, is headed to the judgment seat of Christ. All right, unless you don't have eternal life and you're an unbeliever still, then you're headed for the great white throne. But um, I'm going to take it by faith that everyone in this room tonight is regenerate, a baptized in union with Christ. And so uh, that's the court you're going to. Same one I'm going to. And then we're going to stand before and Jesus Christ is going to... Um, Try by fire, our production. Either wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones. And we're going to suffer loss, and we're going to have reward, according to what we've done here in time. Now, that's what we're looking forward to, okay? And I'm, I'm very thankful that my judge is Jesus Christ, <laughs> okay? I know there's no shortage of human beings that would love to be my judge. Uh, no shortage of human beings that somehow think they are my judge, um, but they're not. And they're not now, they won't ever be. Uh, my master is their master, and we stand before Jesus Christ at the BMC. the Amazingly enough, angels aren't looking forward to Jesus, they're looking forward to us. How's that for home? Okay. They're looking forward to us. And perhaps even that unbelievable, unacceptable thought has sparked Satan and all the other fallen angels to run from that and say, not me. All right, I'm going I'm to be judged by that. those worms, those cockroaches, those dust creatures. Okay? The rabbis uh, were pretty consistent in a lot of their legends and traditions in the sense that considering that Satan's fall was over... Uh, the, and I think they're wrong for this because they didn't place the fall of, of Satan until after the creation of Adam. But they saw Adam and said, no way, we're not serving that. And uh, that places the Ezekiel 28 fall after um, Genesis 1 and 2. But be that as it may, um, angels have us to look forward to. And that's, uh, that's a remarkable thing. All right. So, summary and conclusion. The angelity past, humanity present, eternity future, judgment of angels. Main point A, I want us to understand the connection between Genesis 3 and Daniel 7. All right? To have the understanding of what is happening when the Ancient of Days rules. When the Ancient of Days issues his judicial ruling in Daniel chapter 7. It is, it is uh, critical. Because... The Ancient of Days, God the Father, that's the Ancient of Days, is going to give all judgment to the Son. He gives all judgment to the Son, but He has to, first of all, rule on the Son's behalf first, before He can then give all judgment to the Son. Okay? So He does not give all judgment to Antichrist. He gives all judgment to Christ. He gives all judgment to the seed of the woman, not the seed of the serpent. But it comes right down to it. Uh, this is a contest. This is a, a, a warfare, uh, an adversarial relationship. He is... Satan is the adversary, but he is adversarial to God the Father. And in the adversarial plan against God the Father, he has a beloved son that he exalts. God the Father has a beloved son that he exalts. All right? And so we have the seed of the woman, we have the seed of the serpent. And we have the whole um, reality of the angelic conflict that is 
presented on day one of the fall. When Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, clothed with animal skin, they are given the proto-evangelism, the, the, the prototype gospel message in, in Genesis 3.15. And so the understanding of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, I think, is, is vital. And it's just tragic to me that, that very few churches are involved in that kind of teaching. And then the judgment that then comes in Daniel chapter 7, as Antichrist and his program is condemned, as Jesus is exalted. The Son of Man comes and presents himself before the Ancient of Days. And uh, the Ancient of Days rules on his behalf and on behalf of redeemed saints as well in that chapter. Which is point B. The judgment in the Ancient of Days favors not only the Son of Man, but also the saints of the highest one. The saints of the highest one. And it's kind of mysterious in that chapter because church is still mystery of doctrine, but the Daniel can't just come right out and write royal family of God, body of Christ. Okay? But it's with a New Testament perspective we can look back and we can identify why there are plural thrones that are established in Daniel chapter 7. Why are there plural thrones but only one takes his seat? What are those extra seats all about? Well, we understand it when we get into the New Testament and we see our role in judging the world, our role in judging angels, our role that if we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. And why is it that if all judgment is given to the Son, is, you know, why do we still need multiple seats? Okay? All of these questions we can answer, and the only answer is the church, the bride of Christ. Okay? Because if, if Ancient of Days keeps all judgment to himself, then there's only one seat needed. right? The seat for the Ancient of Days. If all judgment is given to the Son by himself, then there's only one seat needed. Why plural seats? Why plural thrones? But if the son is provided a bride, and if that bride is described as co-heirs, fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, if that bride is described as ruling and judging with Jesus Christ, now all of a sudden, when we put all of these scriptures together, it becomes obvious that now we know why there are the multiple thrones. Why the multiple thrones there are in Daniel 7, why the multiple thrones there are in Revelation chapter 20. And so this is the sequence now that I'm spelling out for us in main point C. All judgment has been given to the Son. All judgment has been given to the Son, but it's important to note, been given to the incarnate, crucified, and risen Son. All judgment has been given to the incarnate. In other words, he humbled himself. Crucified, he was victorious, and risen, exalted son. And um, one of those is he was given authority because he is the Son of Man. He was given this judgment authority because he is the Son of Man. This was the blessing that the Father bestowed upon him as a consequence of his victory. All right? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you at the proper time. Jesus Christ would not have received all the judgment that he received. He would not have received the bride. He would not have received all these things had he not been victorious in humbling himself before the Father as well. This is why Antichrist was cast down and Jesus was, was lifted up. Because what did Antichrist do? He didn't humble himself. He magnified himself. He didn't come and present himself humbly before the Ancient of Days. He exalted himself in defiance of the Ancient of Days. His objective was the overthrow of the Ancient of Days and the exaltation of the dragon. I think ultimately throwing down the dragon too and the exaltation of himself. That's just the way satanic procedures work, right? <laughs> In any event. So, Antichrist exalted himself, so he's thrown down. Jesus Christ humbled himself, so he's lifted up. This is the whole Bible in, in a single message. All right? So all judgment has been given to the Son. The incarnate, crucified, and risen Son. And we see the progression of it there through John chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 9, on into the book of Acts, Acts 10, 42, and Acts 17, 31. Now, in this, we also see progression. We see progression of angelic judgment. We see progression of divine authority being given to men. We see progression of ultimately what we're headed to in um, the glorification of the, of the church and the glorification of Christ. So, 
as this progresses, we see, we see stages. Jesus talks about Satan's fall and he talks about the authority that the 70 are given to uh, cast out demons and to trample scorpions and to, that no power of the adversary can, uh, can hurt them. We see the church with even greater authority than the 70 had. All right? The 70 has some pretty amazing authority. But the apostles and the church have more beyond that. And in the church, we have a defeated and disarmed uh, adversary. And we have our own divine authority that we manifest in Christ. God the Father is leading us in his triumph in Christ. We, we operate here on earth, but we're a reflection of what's happening in heaven. What we bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. What we loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Talk about divine authority. Man, the, the, what the church exercises on earth is staggering compared to the age of Gentiles, age of Jews, or the, even the, the angelic dispensation. It's unbelievable. And we have Christians today that think that our power on earth is, uh, is exercised at the ballot box. Or our power on earth is influencing politicians. That our power on earth is, come on. The salt and light of the body of Christ is spiritual and it's eternal. So we have the church dispensation. Now, in John chapter 16, let's look at this message. Let's uh, pick this up, I guess, with verse... We understand in verse 1, he says, these things I've spoken to you. Um, this is the, all of this is red. You see all this red? <laughs> chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17. If you've got a red letter Bible, then these pages are glowing in this section of, of, your, of your gospel. Uh, this is the upper room and walk to the garden discourse. This is Jesus Christ's final Bible class for his disciples, for the 11. And he starts teaching this when Judas goes out to fetch the soldiers. Judas leaves in chapter 13 to fetch the soldiers. And as soon as that door is closed, uh, John 13, 30, after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately and it was night. Verse 31, therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now, now is the Son of Man glorified. And that now is one of the most powerful nows anywhere in the New Testament. Now is the Son of Man glorified. It's like the, you know, the, Judas walked out, the door closed, okay? And as soon as that door closed, Jesus said, now. And what follows then in verse 31 and following, it finishes chapter 13, you know, the last eight verses of chapter 13, and then chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, most of which is read, is Jesus Christ teaching these 11, maybe, maybe 12, Maybe, maybe I, you know, I suspect Matthias was present with him. And maybe even Judas Barsabbas present with him. In any event, he's giving these apostles their last instructions in an amazing message. In a message they don't understand. The whole, these, this chapter is way over their head. This chapter is, they've got no clue. This chapter, they're, they're hopeless. Because it's going to require the Holy Spirit to lead them into these things. But he's giving it to them so that when the Holy Spirit does come in 53 days... Okay. Um, three days for the resurrection, 50 days after that for Pentecost. All right. When the Holy Spirit does come on Pentecost, he is going to bring to remembrance everything in these chapters. And they're going to be, this, talk about a quick start program, right? They're going to be, they're going to be launching into the church with this as their, as their constitution. This is their, we talk about the, the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount is the constitution for the millennium. Well, the upper room discourse is the constitution for the church. So it's in the process here that he tells them, do not, be, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And first thing he teaches them here is the rapture. And then he starts talking about the, the Holy Spirit is coming. He starts talking about uh, all these things here, all right? Abiding in him and bearing fruit and glorifying the Father. And then he says in chapter 16, these things I've spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. And uh, guess what? You're going to have conflict. They're going to make you an outcast from the synagogue. An hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. There will be religious people that will think that killing you is their religious duty. 
These things I've spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. When their hour comes, it's going to be given to them permiss a permissive will from the Father to attack you. All right. These things I do not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. The church age is different than the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Uh, during the age of Israel, uh, dispensation of Israel, age of the incarnation, the apostles of the Lamb walked with Jesus. In the church, Jesus is seated in the Father's right hand, interceding on our behalf, the apostle and high priest of our confession. And our situation is a whole lot better. Because we're not walking with a monopresent Jesus going from place to place around the world. We're going from place to place around the world with Jesus Christ seated at the Father's right hand, interceding on our behalf, operating as the apostle and high priest of our confession, and sending the Holy Spirit to go with us. He says, uh, now I'm going to him who sent me, and any of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. It is to your advantage. The church age has every advantage over Israel. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You realize the assets we have with the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit throughout this church age and with Jesus Christ in session, seated at the Father's right hand, the apostle and high priest of our confession. The unbelievable assets that we have. So, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, I find it remarkable. I find it sad. The believers take it upon themselves. They've got a mission. And their mission is to bring in the kingdom. The Bible doesn't tell us to do that. Their mission is to fix the world. The Bible doesn't tell us to do that. And what they're doing is they're just slapping whitewash, what Colonel Fiend used to call whitewashing the devil's world. Right? And a good coat of whitewash, yeah, it looks pretty till the first rain hits and then it's gone. And what's left, you know, what's left behind after the rain washes, that's why it's called whitewash, okay? You've got to put another coat on to cover up the fact that this, you know, wood's getting old. Um, are we called to make this world a better place? The Holy Spirit's convicting this world. And we are ministers. You know, ministers of reconciliation, we're agents. We're supposed to be an aroma, and it's an aroma of life to life, but it's also an aroma of death to death. All right. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Make that the issue. Every unbeliever you're talking to is a sinner, but so are you, so don't worry about it. Just uh, with, if, if they want to discuss sin, just discuss it in these terms. It's about belief in Christ. All right? It's all about belief in Christ. I don't care what you've done. It's have you trusted Christ? Concerning sin, because they do not believe me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. We live in an age where a victorious Jesus Christ is seated in the Father's right hand. Okay? Think about it. He no longer beholds the sin. The sin was nailed to Christ. The sin was judged. The sin was of the world was sealed in a bag, thrown behind his back as far as the east is from the west, plunged into the depths of the sea. Now the Father's not looking at the sin anymore. He's looking at his Son, and his Son is right there at his right hand. And that's a standard of righteousness. Okay? Because I go to the Father, and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. The ruler of this world has been judged. So, we have a past completed has been judged. This is point three in the outline. The past completed has been judged must be logically connected to the future promised will judge. All right? Has been judged has to be connected logically now with the future promised will judge. We will judge the world. We will judge angels. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3. Join me there. So clearly, in the uh, upper room discourse, Jesus tells his apostles, the ruler of this world has been judged. 
That's the Daniel 7 judgment when the Ancient of Days rules on behalf of the Son of Man and on behalf of the saints of the Highest One. When He rules against the ruler of this age and when He rules against uh, Satan and his, uh, his beloved Son. The ruler of this world has been judged. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 now. And uh, again, the tragic misdirection of believers that decide they're going to they're going to sue one another. All right. The only thing to be said for the Roman Republic and then the Roman Empire, they were, unlike any culture that preceded them, they were um, litigious. Okay? Unlike any civilization that preceded them. I believe they've been topped now by a civilization that has followed them. Uh, we are a culture that is more litigious than Rome ever dreamed of. But that's because I think we are the heritage of Rome. We are the, uh, the offspring. In any event, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare go to law before the unrighteous, not before the saints? You've got brothers in the local church, and they've got a case. There's an issue. Okay? And it's a legitimate issue. I mean, it exists. It is what it is. You have a case. It's not just that you think you have a case. It's not just that you wish you had a case. You've got a case. Your brother did you dirt. Okay? Uh, this is not a circumstance where it's just all in your mind or it's all just, you know, hurt feelings and blah, blah, blah. There is a legitimate grievance in place. We can't, we've we got to recognize that. It's like the widows that are complaining in Acts chapter 6. They have a legitimate complaint. There are certain widows are being overlooked. Other widows are, are not being overlooked. There's favoritism. It's wrong. The apostle says, all right, we're going to invent something here called deacons and these faithful men are going to take care of that. So it's, it's not a, uh, we want to validate the complaint. It is real. But there is a proper venue to resolve it. The proper venue to resolve it in Acts 6 is not the apostles. It's this new office called deacons, and these guys are going to take care of it. Faithful men are going to get it done. Now, in this instance, uh, a case between brothers ought to be settled amongst brothers. We shouldn't go to the unrighteous. We shouldn't go to the unbeliever. We don't uh, go outside of us to deal with our issues. Do you not know? And so we, go, we dare to go to law before the unrighteous, not before saints. How dare you? Okay? This is the dare language we saw this morning when the apostles wouldn't dare ask Jesus who he was. They knew who he was. But they didn't dare ask who he was. It's because they, you know, they knew. He didn't look like himself, but they knew that's who it was, and they didn't dare ask. The idea of daring, meaning that you're brave, meaning that you're audacious, you know, the audacity of what you're doing, okay? Making yourself the sovereign instead of following God's protocol plan. Do you not know? You should know. The saints will judge the world. Will judge now. Will judge. So there's a future will judge. There's a past has been judged. There's a future will judge. How do we connect those? Now admittedly, the past has been judged is the ruler of the world, not the entire world. And the future will judge is not the ruler of the world, but the world, cosmos in both cases. How do we logically connect these? How do we logically connect the past has been judged with the future promised will judge? We'll judge the world and we'll judge angels. Okay. So, uh, do you not know that the saints will judge the world if the world is judged by you? And it is, first class condition, assumed to be true. Are you not, you ought to be, competent to constitute the smallest law courts? The smallest law courts. It'd be like asking uh, uh, Scalia. I love Scalia. Scalia is brilliant. I wish I had 5% of his intellect. Um, Anthony Scalia and his understanding of the law and the Constitution and the, the founding of this nation is unbelievable. The idea that he would not be qualified to sit on a small claims court in Travis County, you know, listening to, uh, listening to a, a case uh, dealing with, uh, you know, a, a $10 uh, something, you know. 
it would be ludicrous to think that he's not qualified to sit on a court like that, right? Or to sit on a traffic court or to sit on one of these. They've got these teenager courts now in the high schools, right? And, and so the idea that, that um, Clarence Thomas or, or uh, Anthony Scalia, these guys, wouldn't, uh, or even the, the flaming lips that, you know, uh, they'd be qualified, immensely qualified. Ruth Bader Ginsburg could sit on a, uh, one of these high school teenager courts and listen to some 10th grader that was smoking marijuana or something, right? I mean, you're suited for a huge court. You ought to be able to sit to resolve this, right? That's the point. That's the point. It's an a fortiori logic here, from the greater to the lesser, and so forth. So, you, you know what he's fixing us to do, what we're being suited to do. This is what we're being suited to do. Like, you've, you've, you've been trained, you've been suited, you've been ready, you're now you're going to run the, the Boston Marathon next week because you've been working up to the 26 miles, you've been working up to it, you're suited for it, you're trained for it, you're not, not just to complete it, but you're one of the competitors expected to possibly win it. And then, uh, you know, the, the Capital 10,000 here in Austin comes along and it's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not ready for that. Okay? You can A little 5,000K fun run or something. It's ridiculous. Do that without even breaking a sweat. Now, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this bios, matters of this life? Matters of this life. We get so wrapped up in biological life, so wrapped up in the kids we're raising, the women we're married to, the house we live in, the money we make, the food we eat, the places we go, you know, life, daily life. And that's just bios life, bios life. Let's talk about Zoe life. Let's talk about the life that abides eternally, the life that glorifies Jesus Christ. All right. So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? No account. There's no jurisdiction. Think about venue. Think about standing. Think about jurisdiction. These are all legal terms. You realize there's uh, most judges, or most uh, attorneys aren't even authorized to argue cases at the Supreme Court. There's, there's only a, a very finite list. There's a small select group of solicitors that are approved to actually argue cases at the Supreme Court. Other judges or other uh, uh, lawyers and so forth, they, they don't even have standing. They can't even, they're not, they have no credentials to even walk in and, and say anything. Okay? That's the reality that these unbelievers, these earthly courts, they don't have standing to solve our issues in the royal family of God. The royal family of God is, transcends this, this uh, political universe. All right. I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? It's a, it's a wisdom application. Is there an elder? Is there an overseer? Is there a, a, a wise man? Listen to what needs to be listened to. Hear both sides. And then apply divine viewpoint. All right. The brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. Actually, then it's already a defeat for you. You've lost even filing of a lawsuit is a loss. Doesn't matter how it turns out in the court. Win, lose, or draw, that's, that's irrelevant. You lost to start with. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Just abstain. Say, no thanks, I'm not participating in that. And I'll be temporally wrong, but I'm not going to besmirch the glory of Jesus Christ. All right. So, We've got a past completed has been judged, but we also have a future promised will judge. The difference being is the singularities. The singularities. The ruler of this world has been judged. Okay? Think ancient of days, ruling on behalf of his son, ruling against the, the ruler of this world. All right? Establishing for all eternity that Jesus Christ is the victorious celebrity of the universe. All right? Now the future judging, he's being provided a bride. He's being provided a body. See, the logic that makes this connection now is the giving of all judgment to the son and the related giving of judgment to the bride. The related giving of all judgment to the son, John 5. I should have put that on the slide too. All judgment given to the son, John 5, 22 and 27. 
The logic that makes this connection is the giving of all judgment to the Son, but the recognition that the Son is not alone. The Son is being provided a bride. The Son has a body in a head-body unity. We are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. Whatever his, heir, whatever his inheritance is, is our inheritance. His blessings are our blessings. So the logic that makes this connection is the giving of all judgment to the Son and the related giving of judgment to the bride. So we have it here, again, uh, John 5. We grab these and then we'll go to Revelation 20. John chapter 5. Not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. That's verse 22. Verse 27. He gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Because he is the Son of Man. So who Jesus is factors into the Father's decision to delegate this judgment function to Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus Christ? Who is the Son of Man? Because he's not alone. He's not a singularity. He has a body. He's a head with a body, and we're the body. And we are in union with Christ. The idea of separating the bride from the son would be just as unthinkable as separating um, deity and humanity in the hypostatic union. You can't, how do you separate deity and humanity in the hypostatic union? Jesus Christ is undiminished deity and true humanity united together in one person forever. God the Son is God and man in the person of Jesus Christ. And the idea that that would ever stop or that would ever be separated or that would ever be disunified is unthinkable, biblically speaking. Same thing with the head and the body. Is Jesus ever going to be decapitated? No. He is the head of the church, which is his body. And so the giving of all judgment to the bride... I think it makes perfect sense, like hand and glove. It, it, it completes the idea that all judgments have been given to the Son, but the Son's not alone. Think about it. Adam was given work to do, and it's not good for the man to be alone. So what did God provide for Ha'adam? Isha, the woman, the helper for the work to which he was assigned. Now here's the last Adam. It's not good for the last Adam to be alone. What's he provided? Isha? No. Ecclesia. Church. All right. And why is, the, why is the last Adam given the church? Why is the last Adam provided a bride? He needs a helpmate for his work assignment. All right. You know the amazing aspects on this. <laughs> it's just... Uh, Remarkable to consider. And, and then you get this infantile view that says, well, you know, okay, I believe in Jesus. Now I'm just going to wait to go to heaven when I die. What? There's a whole lot more to the Christian way of life than just getting saved and waiting to die. There's work to be done. There's lessons to learn. There's growth to attain to. There's assignments. All, these are all preparatory for what's coming up. Undeserved discipline to endure. Uh, hard knocks to go through. Jesus learned through the things that he suffered. We're going to learn through the things that we suffered. Are we going to be suitable to be these judges? That means we got some conflict to go through. Finally, then Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Now you will note the church, the ecclesia is not seen again after chapter 3. All right. The book of Revelation is broken down into the things which are, the things which, uh, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which take place after these things. There's your outline for Revelation. The church is, is filled in, in chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches, but then it's gone. We don't see the church in chapters 4 and following. All right? in, and you get a heavenly scene in chapters 4 and 5, and then when we go back to earth again, it's the nations in Israel. There's no glimpse of the church anywhere in chapter 6 through 19. So uh, we understand that the church is raptured. We're caught up to be with the Lord. We then return with him in chapter 19. We're dressed in white, riding white horses. 
The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. That's 1914. And so we follow when he comes back. I believe thus we shall always be with the Lord means thus we shall always be with the Lord. It means that the trumpet, when he descends to the, to the clouds, we meet him in the air. That means when he goes back to heaven, we go with him back to heaven. That means when he presents us to the Father, we, we're with him in being presented to the Father. That means when he partakes of his wedding supper, we're with him partaking of the wedding supper. That means when he descends on white horses, we descend on white horses. Because thus we shall always be with the Lord. When he sits in Jerusalem reigning, we're going to sit in Jerusalem reigning. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so he descends and he lays hold of the, uh, of the Antichrist. Look at the end of chapter 19. 1919, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown, notice now, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. They don't stand for the judgment in chapter 20. They don't even stand for the judgment at the great white throne. They go straight to the lake of fire. Why? Because the ruler of this world has been judged. The ruler of this world has been judged. All right. Then in chapter 20, an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, a great chain in his hand, laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Threw him into the abyss, shut it, sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. The Gentile nations during the thousand year reign, they're going to rebel on their own. They're not going to need angelic uh, influence to do so. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones. Now this is key, verse 4. Because this is what matches with Daniel 7. Multiple thrones, all established at the same time, in the same place. And they sat on them. Ooh, that's new. Those thrones weren't seated in Daniel chapter 7, but they are seated here. Those thrones are seated there are judges that are vested with judicial authority. And so the thrones are seated after Armageddon. The bride has been suited to do so. And judgment was given to them. Judgment was given to them. Now let me ask you, just logically, is there any other way, besides the way I'm teaching you tonight, is there any other way by which all judgment can be given to the Son but this judgment given to them and have that not be a contradiction. If all is all, that has to include this. All judgment is all judgment. That has to include this judgment, but this judgment is given to them. So again, we have to have a logical completion here. We have to have a logical connection between the past judgment, the future judgment, the logical connection between all judgment given to the Son and this judgment given to the church. And as I've been saying, that connection is the reality that Christ and the church are one. It's head and body. Christ and the church have all judgment been given to them from God the Father. All right. And I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God. These are the tribulational martyrs. And those who had not worshipped the beast or the image who received his mark on their forehead. So they rejected Antichrist and they paid a physical price for it. They're going to be rewarded. And uh, they come to life, they reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's not the church. That's not the church. The church is on the thrones judging these guys. These guys are being resurrected and standing before the church for their judgment. And then they are uh, ushered into the provisional government of the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. See, because they reign with Christ, they say, well, we reign with Christ, they reign with Christ. That must be talking about us. No, they reign with Christ for a thousand years. We reign with Christ forever. I know a thousand years seems like a long time, but it's a day job. Okay? A day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. 
These guys are serving for one day, the day of the Lord. That's all they're serving. It's a provisional government. It is a temporary government. It is a conquest government. Think about what happens when you conquer a land and you set up a provisional government and the conquering uh, nations establish a provisional government only until the permanent government can be established. The millennial kingdom is the provisional government of the conquest of Jesus Christ. And his administrators are going to be resurrected tribulational martyrs. Those that were beheaded by Antichrist. They get their heads back and they're glorified and they, uh, they're going to serve as the administrators in the millennial thousand year time period. The rest don't come to life until the thousand years are complete. Unbelievers have to wait till after the millennium. All right, well, so here's the logic that makes this connection. The related giving of all judgment to the bride. So think about it. I think the, um, we'll pick up on this Sunday morning. The, um, consider that everything Jesus went through in the first advent all the hardships, all the sufferings, all of the adversity, all of the, the grief, man of sorrow is acquainted with grief, all of the, um, uh, the, the, the true passion, right? The actual suffering that he endured was instructive. It was also equipping. It prepared him to be the judge of the living and the dead. How do you think you and I are being prepared to be judges with him? Same thing. We're going to learn through the things that we suffered. We're going to complete what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. We're going to be the spectacles to this world. So just be, be ready for it. All right. One final point or a couple issues, depending on how I tweet this between now and Sunday, and angelology will be finished to tell us that. Okay. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Thank you for uh, your patience that you uh, just so graciously and slowly, step by step, doctrine by doctrine, principle by principle. This, is, this isn't easy stuff. Uh, this, this requires thought. This requires connecting Old Testament to New Testament, Israel to church, all the whole vast spectrum of the plan of God. Genesis 3 and the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, all the way to Revelation 20. Uh, the end of Revelation, Father, this is, this is comprehensive. And I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding to not only know it, but be oriented properly, Father, where we can start suiting, being suited to being the judges that you're crafting us to be. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name.